We're in our series talking about don't think can't, right? And I know that sounds so awkward, doesn't it? It's this thought process, though, for us that if God calls you to something, if God calls you to a ministry, if God calls you to a relationship, to a job, to a something outside of you, you are to not think, I can't do that. You are to think according to the Word of God, and you are to think that it, all things are possible through Christ Jesus. He is in me. Greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. And I am going to walk in obedience and submission to what He has called me to walk in. Here's what we know about calling. When you are called by God... The the calling is always bigger than you are. It is always bigger than the current resources that you have at your disposal. Whether you think that is intellectual, academic, emotional, sometimes it's just emotional, right? I, you're like, I do not have the emotional bandwidth to handle the call that God has placed on my life. Those of you that have raised kids, there's times you go, I don't have the emotional bandwidth to do what you've called me to do right now. But His grace is sufficient for us. Amen? When He calls you to it, especially sometimes when, when you first find out you're pregnant with that first child, very few of us are ready for the 16-year-old conversation. Have you ever been in the middle of a conversation with one of your teenagers and you go, Oh, dear Lord, I am not prepared for this. In this moment, they are smarter than I am, and you start praying. I'm thankful that the Word of God says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask, and God will give it, because I have been in the middle of conversation before, and at the same time, I'm going, oh, Lord, please help me right now. I am in over my head. Sometimes I've been talking to you, and I've had to ask that same gift from God. Give me wisdom here. We've been talking about this prophetic word that the Lord just dropped into our heart and into our life from the stage just a few weeks ago when the Lord, during our exhortation through me, He said, there is grace for your new season. There is charis, anti-charis. There is more grace for your next season, and I am preparing you to step into all that I have for you. And we've examined some scriptures that talk about He is supply, He is not lack, and that's the first thing we have to think about. That's the first thing we have to understand when we think about our calling and when we think about the Lord, we are to never think lack. We're never to think can't. We're always to think supply. And we're always to think abundance when you think about Jesus. Now, how many of us, our default thinking is lack, can't, I'm not able, I'm not good enough when it comes to the kingdom of God? I'll tell you, I am. I tend to want to look on paper what I really have at my disposal, and then I go, I just, it doesn't add up. But that is the call of God to step into a season of faith with a grace that will meet us there. Amen? And so I, I realized earlier this week that I haven't even taken you to the original text over the past couple of weeks. We talk about grace for grace, and then I take you to 15 other scriptures. I want to take you to a place where, the, where this word, grace for grace, is outlined for us, okay? And it is in the Gospel of John. We'll spend just a few minutes here before we receive communion in just a few moments. But as it's in the Gospel of John, and John is writing, and he's thinking about Jesus. He's thinking about the deity of Jesus. He's thinking about just the fullness of who Jesus is and all of the, the good things provided by the ministry of Jesus. And as he's, as he's thinking and as he's, as he's writing, he, he says this in the, the first chapter of John, early on. In chapter, verse 16, he says, Out of His, out of Christ's fullness, we have all received grace in place of a grace already given. I want you to hear it in this translation today. Grace in place of a grace that has already been given. This is who He is, and this is what He wants us to hear. Out of His fullness. And I'm going to take just a few moments just a few moments today, and to break down these certain phrases of this particular uh, passage. Essentially, this passage is telling us that Jesus is the fullness, and in Him there is a never-ending, inexhaustible supply of grace. There, so, uh, essentially, if grace, Jesus is grace, He's not just a doctrine, not just an entity, not just a, a theological thought. But if, if Jesus had a bank account in heaven of grace, 
and you made a, a, a withdrawal of grace and you took out $10 of grace, it doesn't go down one penny. It is an inexhaustible account of grace. And in literally, theologically, the more withdrawals you make, the more supply there is. That's why the Apostle Paul will have to write in caution. Should we sin more? So more and more grace will abound? He has to answer that and say, God forbid. Absolutely not. Though there is more and more grace for every time sin occurs, there's a hoopo in the Greek, hoopo. It, it, it means like hyper. It means abundant. It means so much you can't even comprehend. It's almost as if it is wasteful, but he can't waste any ounce of it. He is pouring out so much grace on your life, that, and it is, he is a never-ending, inexhaustible, source of grace. That's what he's meaning here in the very first aspect of this, this verse. He says, out of his fullness. It's out of the fullness of Christ. It's not out of our fullness. It's not out of our worth. It's not out of our ability. It's not out of us, right? But he does deem us worthy for some reason. He loves us so much, he says, you are worthy of my grace, so I'm going to lavish grace on your life out of his fullness. Whatever you have in Jesus, you have because of who he is, and you have because of his relationship with the Father. And he pours out on you grace for your life. It comes from his fullness, our relationship with him. In this same chapter, just a couple of verses before John writes this about Jesus. He is full of truth and grace. The Word says this, the Word became flesh. God loves us so much that He sent His one and His only Son. And Jesus loves us so much, He left heaven. This is grace in action, folks. This is the fundamental, penultimate, most ultimate grace ever demonstrated to us. Is that Jesus loves us so much that He walked out of heaven, was clothed in flesh, and lived among us a sinless life to demonstrate 30 years, 33 plus years of active grace and relational grace to set you free from the curse of the law of sin and death. He clothed himself in flesh. He dwelt among us. And here's just an aspect of grace. We have seen, we have beheld his glory. That's part of our DNA here at Park West. I desire every single Sunday, my heart beats for, my heart longs for every Sunday that during worship we behold the glory of Jesus Christ. That every song points to Jesus. That, that our sermons point to Jesus. And, and that our ministries point to Jesus. And that we behold the glory. The glory of the one and the only Son who came in grace, full of grace, and full of truth. And that encourages me in my day-to-day -day life. That Jesus Christ is full of all grace and He's full of all truth. And when I run into situations, circumstances, and trials, and tribulations, and, and things that I can't comprehend, and things that I can't explain, even with a little bit of a theological background, there are times, and can I just be transparent? There are times my own theology sometimes will get a little shaken, and I go, I, I know I believe this, but some, there's an attack, there's something that comes against you, and you go, oh my goodness, is this? And there is something that comes through. The grace of God comes flooding in. And then when I don't know what I don't know, but I know I believe something that I don't really know. I mean, ever been there? Unless you've all got the Bible completely memorized, and you fully have applied it all, and you understand, not only do you have the words memorized, you understand the nuances and the intricacies and all of the, all of the theology of it. There are times we come face to face with something, and we know we know something, but we don't know what we know. I know that I know, but I don't know what I know. And I trust in those moments that His grace and His truth. Because the Spirit of God says, Jesus says this, when the Spirit comes, He will guide you into all truth. And so in those moments of trial, in those moments of, of heartbreak, in those moments of I just don't know, or in the moments of, of joy, and, and that He'll come along and He'll give truth 
to sustain us in the season of our grace, right? He's full of grace and he's full of truth. And those aren't two sides of one coin. They are the same. I know you've heard it said. I have probably said it myself. Grace and truth are two sides. You've got to have truth to balance grace. That's not true. True truth and true grace are interwoven into the person of Jesus Christ. It's not about, well, that's some truth, but you need to season that with some grace. Real grace is real truth, and real truth is real grace, and the truth will set you free. That's grace. Amen? We're Western in our mindset, and we, we compartmentalize things, and we have to say, okay, this is truth, and this is grace. No, it's truth. He is truth, and he is grace. Amen? I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. He is the bread of life. He is the door. Is he the door? Is he the bread? Yes. Right? Is he the good physician? Is he the good shepherd? Yes. He's your everything. Amen? This is grace revealed to us. Jesus Christ, out of his fullness, which simply means that you will never exhaust his fullness and you will never comprehend all of his fullness. You've been a saint for 97 years. You've still got more to learn about his fullness. Amen? Because that's how amazing He is. So out of His fullness, He is poured out on us. We are incomplete without Him. And apart from Him, John will go on to write, quoting Jesus, just a few chapters later, chapter 15, apart from Him, you can do nothing. And some, one theologian, scholar said it this way, you can do no thing that has eternal value. You can do no thing. You can do something, but it is really nothing. You can accumulate wealth. You can be influential. You can lead. You can do things. You can make fame for yourself. You can do some things, but when it boils down to it, you have accomplished nothing. Because it has no significant spiritual significance. It has no eternal value. The gospel is the only thing of eternal value. The good news about Jesus Christ. Why do I talk about the gospel every week? Because that's the only thing that will radically and forever change your life is his gospel, his good news. That he is for you, not against you. He's all we could ever need. He is our infinite source of grace. He is our infinite source of truth. And I tell you, I am so grateful. I am so deeply moved by this fresh, basic revelation again today. I think most of you understand that He is full of grace and truth. I think most of you understand that He is omniscient and He is omnipotent. That in He has all power and He has all knowledge, all wisdom. I think you get that. But when you need it in the day-to-day, you need it in the nitty-gritty, and he shows himself faithful, there is something beautiful about the simplistic gospel being revealed afresh and anew in your daily walk again and again. Amen? And this is who he is for you. He is your supply. Second uh, part of this verse where he says, we have, out of his fullness, we have all received grace. Because I can feel it in this room. Maybe it's online. Maybe it's, well, I don't want to pick on you in the room because you're here. Maybe we'll pick on the folks online. Maybe at home right now watching this, you're saying, yeah, Jeremy, there's grace for you, but I haven't received any grace. This passage says we have all received grace. Every one of you. Now, here's the human condition. You want to compare how much grace you have received versus the person on TV or the person down the street or the person in the bigger office or the person that seems like they always win or this or that. We want to compare ourselves, don't we? And the human condition of comparison always leads to this. Comparison kills. It'll kill your joy. It'll kill your peace. It'll kill your contentment. It'll kill your your expectation of your walk with the Lord. Well, my goodness, I've I've had physical battles. I've had physical battles. I've had physical battles. That person over there, they've lived like hell on wheels, and they don't have one single problem with their body. My joints hurt all the time. They've done all this, and they've not taken care of their body. And you are comparing the measure of grace in your life versus the measure of grace in their life, and you're getting distracted 
Well, we can take that and scale that out to finance, to relationship, to business, to, to academics, to sports, to any arena that the enemy or the flesh can start nick, nipping away at you to get you to compare yourself. But we've all been given grace. All of us. It's not my word, it's the word of God. Let me just, let me get it baseline for you. Are you breathing? Grace. Right? You are breathing His air. Some of you had to check. Yeah, I am breathing. That's a grace of intellectual. Oh, okay, I, I didn't. I'm sorry. But so we have to check. But it's His breath. It's His air. The Word of God in Colossians will tell you this, that if He ceases to hold you together, you're gone. That's the McGinnis translation. But it says He holds all things together. Essentially, if Jesus removes his presence from this little piece of wood, it no longer exists. The molecules are being held together by him. And so you have experienced grace. There's different levels of grace and there's different uh, aspects of his grace. But all of us, you are here today. You are receiving the grace of being able to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is a big time grace. You've been, if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, His grace is active in your life. There is the saving grace of God that is operating in your life. And He wants to pull you in farther. If you're, if you're, if you're living on the planet, if you've seen a sunrise, you, we, were talking, we were joking about sunrises the other day, and, and my son, he's 17, he said, I think I may have seen two. And we're like, okay, that's because you sleep in all the time, right? But that's, that, that's on Him. But sunrises, sunsets, Stars in the sky, the shades of green in Cade's Cove are all just a taste of His grace to draw us in what we call general revelation. Just a general revelation of the goodness of God that He exists and He exists for you. This is His goodness. We've all received grace. Matthew will record it this way in chapter 5, verse 45. He causes His Son to rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. We have all received grace for life. And if you compare grace, you can look at the, the heathen, you can look at the, the sinner, and you can be jealous of the amount of grace that they've received in a particular area. But here's what you need to always know. If you have received the eternal grace, if you receive salvation, in the end, there is zero comparison. Because you will be in heaven forever and ever. Amen? The grace of God. So the passage again tells us, out of His fullness, inexhaustible grace. We all have received grace. Whether you're a one-talent grace or a 20-talent grace, receive the grace of God and be faithful with the grace on your life. Amen? You're getting that? You're holding on to that? You're, you're good with that? And then it says this, in, a, in place of a grace that has already been given. There was a grace in your life for yesterday. Just a couple of weeks ago, I said, when God calls you into a new season, alluded to it again today, when God calls you into a a new season, there will be a new grace, there will be a new mercy, there will be a new anointing, there will be new resources for the new call. Many of you have made career changes, many of you have made grace changes, you have stepped into a new calling, you stepped into a new thing, and you have seen God provide what you had lack in and of yourself when you stepped into the new arena, God was there with a new resource, a new wisdom, a new knowledge, a new right hand person, a new a person that would go out before you, a new person that would hold your arms up, a new person that carried a big towel and would clean up your mess. There is somebody there being a demonstration of his grace in the new season. And he wants to call you into that. Now let me back up for just a moment and give you the, the ultimate grace upon grace, grace for grace, because this is the gospel message. Does God give you new grace for your new calling? Does God give you new wisdom and new, new resource for your next season? 100%. But it is all based on the original grace exchange. And this is what he's talking about right here. The original, the first 
Jesus died for our sins so that we could live in him and we could live through him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and his only son. And Jesus so loved us that he yielded and became the perfect sacrifice to take our place on the cross. This is the gift of salvation. This is the gift of his eternal grace. This is, and, and, and some of you that are going, uh, this grace thing. Here's the simple definition. Here's the working definition. It is undeserved, unearned, unmerited favor. So the very definition of grace, if you have grace at all in your life, you need to understand you did not earn, you did not deserve the amount of grace you got. Right? All of us deserve hell and damnation. Are you okay with that? Do you believe that? Some of you are like, no, I'm pretty good. You were dead in your trespasses. While you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. While you had no hope and you had no vision, you had no salvation in your life, Christ died for you. And so the, the, the tiniest bit of grace that's operating in your life, you are unworthy of it. And so it's unmerited, undeserved, unearned favor, His grace. And before Jesus showed up, Before Jesus lived on this earth, the only grace that operated was the law. The only grace we had was the law, the old covenant. God loves so much, and God has so much vision within himself, he called Abram out of Ur of Chaldees. He said, go. Sometimes the call, all you get is go. God says, go. Here's the call, go. We want like a huge plan, don't we? We want a dissertation on go. And he says, go. And going brings grace. Every step, there's a new grace. He will order your steps and he will guide your path. But God cut covenant with Abram, Abraham. God cut covenant with David. God cut covenant with Moses. God is a, a gracious, covenantal God that cuts covenant. And we, before Jesus, all we had was a covenant, a good covenant, a, a gracious covenant, but it was a covenant based on the law. My son and I, Luke, and we were talking about this the other day, driving back from somewhere, and we were talking about grace and mercy. We were talking about the judgment and, and love and mercy. And, he, and he, was, he was engaging well. It was one of those moments I was like, okay, Lord, wisdom, I need help here. And I remembered a paper I wrote back in seminary, Mercy Versus Righteousness. And this whole paper just outlined that, honestly, the mercy of God demands His judgment. If it's just mercy and there's no judgment, but see, God loves you so much. He threw a massive curveball at the enemy that actually hit the enemy in the head and crushed his head. And it's called the cross of Calvary. And on the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ, when he showed up, he didn't abolish the law. He said, I'm going to perfect that stuff. I'm going to take care of it. I was there when the law was written, and my perfect holy blood will take care of this. And then he died on the cross, and he crushed the head of the enemy, and he took the keys to death, hell, and the grave, and he now nailed the righteous requirements of the law to the tree, and he said, you are free. But before the cross, the grace of the law was that there is protection and there is some ministry there. But Jesus shows up and Paul will write in 2 Corinthians 3, that grace pales in comparison to this grace. That glory pales in comparison to this glory. That is, And then Paul's words, don't throw anything at me. Paul said it was a ministry of death. But there was still grace in it. But the ultimate exchange of grace was when Jesus shows up and said, I'm going to now become the grace in your life. I'm going to take place of all that other grace. And I'm going to operate in your life in such a way that you can't even imagine. It will blow your mind. And you don't think he says this. I'm going to take you to a place where he essentially says it that way. We have this gift He's transformed our lives. He prays a prayer like this. We know that, back up for a minute, in John, John outlines this. He doesn't take as long as I've taken, but John says this, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth come through Jesus Christ. And so that is this grace for grace. This old grace of the law has now been covered, fulfilled, not just just abolished, 
fulfilled, brought to completion. And now there is a new grace on the scene. And we operate under this grace. Paul will write, if you fall from this new grace, you're falling back into the law. Correct? In Galatians. If you fall from this new grace, this, if you fall from grace, you're literally falling back into the law. It's what Paul will write. So we walk in this new grace, this dynamic grace, this active grace, this living grace, this grace that's new every morning. His mercies are new every morning. Jesus writes in, or Jesus prays in John 17, 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me. This grace is a relational grace. It's a grace of proximity that we are close to him, that they be with me where I am to see my glory. To behold the glory of the Lord that you have given me because you love me before the foundation of the world. This is the grace of God activated, operating in our life. That's why Paul will write, it is by grace, for by grace you are saved through faith and not of yourselves. Lest any man should boast, it is the work of the cross that draws us in. Yes, are we to celebrate the grace of God in our day-to-day life, that there is a new grace this morning for me to be effective in the kingdom. There's a new grace this morning for me to, to be able to parent my kids. Absolutely, but we are to never lose sight of the ultimate new grace, this grace upon a grace that already was there, and in the grace He is Jesus Christ revealed in the Word. That is who He is. And we're to experience this same resurrected life that He has given to us. I want to close with one scripture, and we'll, what we'll do is we'll go to, we'll take communion in just a, a few minutes. It's a verse that I have been parking on often here lately, and it's found in John again, John 10, Jesus speaking. And he says this to us The thief does not come except to kill, to steal, and to destroy. We're not ignorant. There is an enemy out there, and he is roaming around as a roaring lion, as if he were one. He is not. The lion, the tribe of Judah, is the only real lion. But he's masquerading either as an angel of light or masquerading as a lion, trying to deceive you with false doctrines or trying to intimidate you with a false roar. And that is who he is. But he does want to steal, he does want to kill, and he does want to destroy. But Jesus says this, and this is a full revelation of his grace, but I have come. I have come, and I am here, and I am the exchange. I am the glorious exchange for righteousness instead of sin on the cross. And I am the exchange of the law now for grace. And he says this, I have come to give life and life more abundantly. The Greek word abundant right here in this passage is parison. And it means exceedingly, uh, beyond measure, more. A quantity so abundant, hear this, a quantity so abundant as to be considerably more than what one would expect or anticipate. I am praying that an abundance of grace will be revealed to you. Not simply poured out. I was praying earlier this week, Lord, I believe you want to pour out grace, pour out grace. He has poured out grace and he is, I am now praying for a revelation that you would, your eyes would open. And this is something I can't do for you. I can't come by spiritually and pull the scales off your eyes. But spiritually, there is a revelation coming to your heart that there is a grace present in your life now that is a quantity so abundant as to be considerably more than what one would expect or anticipate. It reminds me of another scripture that he wants to do exceedingly, abundantly, beyond what you can ask. There are times I have in my mind, I have a big plan. I have a big ask. And it's in my mind thinking it, but I can't even ask it. I can't get my mouth to say, will you please? I can't get my mouth to articulate. But my mind has thought the big ask. Jesus goes so much further. He says, there's stuff I'm going to do that you can't ask, but you can't even think it. 
I have a good imagination, and I have imagined this place packed wall to wall five different times on a Sunday. I have imagined that. I've, and not just so we got big numbers and that we can say, oh, look at us. No, 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 that there are 3,000 souls that are saved. They're washed in the blood of Jesus. They're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And that, and that money is flowing in. Why? So we can get a bigger house? Absolutely not. Heather and I talked the other day, and we said, we don't even need a bigger house. We don't want a bigger house. We don't, we don't need any of that. What we want is I want when anybody comes into this house and they say, you know what? God's called me to India. God's called me to Guatemala. God's called me to Peru. God's called me to Ecuador. God's called me to this. And, and we vet them and we know and we say it bears witness with our spirit too. Well, you start doing a little bit of work, but in, in, in case there isn't enough work for you to get and you're, you're going to raise, you're going to do. But you know what? We've got his resource here and we can fund the gospel going anywhere. I don't want us to have to turn away one widow that says we've got a request. What was it, Paul? Was it 70 something uh, specific widows this needs this this year, right? So far this year, 70 specific needs from widows. Some of those have had two and three needs, but 70 needs we have met this year already with widows. I don't want to turn one away, right? I don't want to turn one kid away. I want to see a quantity so abundant as it is to be considerably more than what we would expect or anticipate. This is abundance. This is grace in action. Amen? This is the word of the Lord for us. And we're going to seal this with His blood and His body today. Why do we do this? Because we believe there is grace in Him. He is grace. As you are standing with me, if you'll raise your hand, if you didn't receive the elements, we'll get an usher to you as quickly as we can to serve you the elements. If you prepare your heart and your mind this morning, maybe you're here today and you say, Jeremy, I, I have, I really don't have faith to believe in the grace that God has for my life. I want to pray for you today, for His grace is sufficient. I hope some of you have had an awakening today. I hope some of you, your faith has been challenged. Isn't it interesting to say that grace can challenge our faith? That His grace can come at us in such a way that it causes us to need to, to want to, to trust Him even more because His grace is so extravagant? Thank you for that nod. His grace is for you today. Whatever you have need of. If it's healing, He has healing. Why? Because He went to the cross. If He died for your sin, then the resources you need are nothing for Him to take care of. Amen? If He would abolish your sin and fulfill the law, don't you think He's going to take care of the secondary third, fourth, and fifth level things. As Father, sanctify these elements. There's nothing magical in these, but oh my goodness, there is something beautiful and mystical in the body of Christ. So this wafer and this juice, they represent you. We sanctify them. We set them apart as holy unto you right now. And Lord, we sanctify our soul and our mind, body, soul, and spirit to taste and see that the Lord is good. And as the psalmist declared, even under the old grace, even under the old covenant, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Lord, you're the one that is right now healing the sick. You're the one that is forgiving the sinner. You are washing clean, Lord, the attic. You're giving new identity, Lord, to the one dealing with sexual perversion. You are here today, and you're online, and you're, you're permeating the airwaves, Lord, and the computer screens, and the YouTube, and all of that. You are touching souls. And on that night that he was betrayed, he took the bread, and he blessed it, and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. He told them to take and eat, for this is my body, and we receive in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Seems so strange, Lord, that our physical body would symbolically and in a typology absorb a little wafer. But Lord, our soul and our spirit right now just receive 
the risen Christ, the Passover lamb, the bread of God, the manna from heaven, the supply that we need. And then he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples and he told them to take and drink all of you. For this is my blood that is shed for the remission of sin in the new covenant. And we receive. We're not simply sinners saved by grace, but we are saints. We are overcomers. We're more than conquerors. We've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And it is by your stripes that we're healed. And it is the chastisement of our peace was placed upon you that we have the mind of Christ and the helmet of salvation. No anxiety, worry, depression, or fear or phobia will come against us. No sickness or disease will derail us. Lord, we are walking in the provision of the cross. We're going to advance the kingdom and we're going to destroy the works of the enemy. Not because of us, but because of who you are. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Can you give him one more good clap of praise?